Right? Saturday. Um, my name is Rena Wan, and we are uh, AWA. I'm part of AWA, and it's uh, the Asian Women uh, in the Arts Collective that we were invited by the Red Dot Campaign, thank you very much, to uh, take part in this panel and hold it. Asian Women in the Arts is an arts collective that's not only domestic but global for all Asian women in the arts and our lovely allies to promote uh, spaces for women who, Asian women in the arts, who want to showcase their work and also network as well. So, before I go on about myself, I'd like to introduce our lovely panel here. I'll end with my introduction, but I'll start with Jenny to my right. Hey everyone, um, I'm Jenny Dorsey. I'm a chef here in New York City. I do kind of an amalgamation of different things, but I come from a fine dining restaurant background and now do a lot of consulting as well as merging food with emerging technology, uh, especially augmented and virtual reality. So yeah, um, I'm sure I'll dive into all the other random things that I do. I host a podcast as well with Heritage and some other kind of like, you know, one-off things. But yeah, excited to be here. Hi, I'm Isabel Jassa, you can call me Iz. Um, I'm an actor, um, but right now I'm, I'm having the title of assistant fight choreographer. <laughs> Isabel, talk about uh, what you're working on currently. Uh, what, what's uh, I'm currently working on um, Henry VI at the National Asian American Theater Company, and they're an all, uh, all Asian American cast, um, and that company does a lot of like classical theater, a lot of Shakespeare and all of that. Hi everyone, I go by P.S. Kaguya, um, aka Didi, informally. Um, I am a body positive activist, model, plus size model, um, sex positive, um, yeah, all general, expressing myself through Instagram, basically. <laughs> um, my name is Lucy Sweetkill. I'm a professional dominatrix. Um, I also run a company called La Maison de Rouge, with my business partner who is also Asian American. And our company, we do a Monday broadcast, live broadcast on Periscope, talking about kink and alternative sexualities and the intersection of kink and wellness. And I've been a pro-dom in the city for eight, nine years now. Awesome. Let's give a round of applause for our lovely ladies. And uh, just a quick note about me, I'm Zarina, like I said, I'm a professional filmmaker, I'm a writer, director, I have a feature out on the uh, festival circuit now as well as a short, and yeah, that's about it. So let's just get into it. Uh, all of these wonderful women are from creative fields, but in different variations of what the creative field is, you guys are also changing the creative field and what you are doing. So I kind of want to just learn a little bit more about what creativity actually is to you and how you guys found yourselves on your paths. Um, I've been talking about this a lot with people. I think the big thing that I've learned throughout my journey um, is that for me, creativity is about vulnerability and how to express my vulnerability in a way that matches my artistic talents, which is cooking um, and plating especially. So recently I debuted a project uh, called the Asian in America at the Museum of Food and Drink. Frisco was there and so was Britt. Um, and it was a six course dinner that was uh, paired with virtual reality as well as poetry and spoken word performance talking about the multifaceted Asian American experience through symbolic ingredients, symbolic cooking techniques and also symbolic like presentation styles. Everything from taking a moon cake and deconstructing it and making it fancy by using only French techniques Techniques and talking about how we have these implicit cultural hierarchies in the way we consume food, eat food, talk about food, review food, who is reviewing our food, um, etc. Well, creativity in me is really um, following my passion and where just, and this sounds really convoluted, but just where the journey takes me or where like the winds take me. I feel like I've had, I've tried really hard to like stay on like a certain path like as an actor I went to school for musical theater and I started out as a da as a dancer um, and on the way like in school I you know discovered the magic of Shakespeare the magic of physical theater ensemble based theater things that like people who are in the musical theater world really not not very keen on and not very aware on um, and I found Commedia which is an Italian um, 
art form with masks and acting, and also fight choreography. And it was, it was like, I was like a duck to water. Um, and luckily, one of my professors saw that um, and have, has kind of guided me through that. Um, and just like dance, fight choreography is, is still movement. So the two things are like the same to me. And it's, again, it's just kind of finding that passion. I have a really big passion for dance and movement in general and, and all of that. And, and kind of, you know, seeing how, how, where that path takes me and like kind of following where, where, where people kind of take me with them on that journey. So yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I'm just thinking like, um, well, my discovery for being a model was fully, not 100% intentional. Um, I would say I started off always doing like artsy stuff, like into music, and then I got my cosmetology license because my parents are like the stereotypical Asians who own a beauty supply. And then I went to photo school, and then I learned photography. And then, um, Basically, I just had it in my mentality that I wanted to do high fashion, that I wanted to do beauty editorials, but as I was working and learning while I was at SVA, actually in New York, um, I was just like, I am not about this beauty standard. I'm not about making size zero girls skinnier because the lingerie companies want me to give her extra boobs or like a smaller thigh gap to reach to the heavens. And then, <laughs> and then so I was just like, I'm not about this life. And then I went into the e-commerce, you know, making do, just being an Asian woman, working in the, like, a photography industry. And even though it's artistic, it's still very, like, machismo, in a sense. So I wasn't getting paid for what I was worth. And I did not like that. And ultimately, it took, like, 27 years of my life to realize that I put myself in a category where I was like, I'm not good enough because I am bigger than, like, the average size girl. I am not good enough because this is the mentality of how I was raised as like a full on 100% Asian woman. Um, and then it took me like to do a lot of self reflection and then I realized I was like, why am I not happy with myself? And my insecurity and the thought of me just not being happy, like not having enough self love prevented me from doing my best out in my creativity. So it didn't happen until like 2016 of October. Halloween came around. I bought a Red Riding Hood costume after like five years of not even celebrating Halloween. And then my friend was running late, so I was like, I'm gonna take some pictures of me. And then that's where it all started. Just me trying to like figure out of how I would feel comfortable. And like in the beginning, I would do Photoshop more so than I would do now. Now I'm like, that is too much. That's too much blurring. But like, you know, like the progression of me trying to like feel comfortable in front of the camera gave me the ultimate medium of me being able to express all the craft that I learned for all these years. So yeah. <laughs> um, for me, creativity is all about its sexual expression. So um, my whole job is about, you know, getting people to express themselves, especially the deep parts that most people don't. You know, they don't, we don't have conversations about our sexuality as much as we think we do. Um, as much as we think we're very sex positive, I see this, you know, all my clients, I, see, I work with couples who've been married for 20 years and don't even realize they're both kinky or wanna explore and it's, and so my whole job is about being, getting people to explore sexually with each other, with themselves and being able to communicate that and also be able to communicate it in a creative way sometimes. And it's not about just saying, I want sex or I'm into this. It's, you know, there are other ways of playing with your sexuality that don't define you and that you can be a lot more fluid about it. And for me, like that all came about because I had my own ideas of my own sexuality coming from a very traditional Vietnamese family. And you, first off, Asian people don't talk about sex at all, and all of a sudden you're supposed to just be married somehow. <laughs> and, you know, and so I struggled with a lot of coming to terms with my own sexuality, coming to terms with the idea that I identified as dominant, 
the idea that I was super kinky and a total weirdo and was into weird shit and I wasn't allowed to express any of that until you know I came across you know and I grew up in the Bay Area which is super sex positive and still wasn't able to like express that and so it took a little bit for me to like come to terms with that and thankfully the internet is helpful uh, <laughs> but once like once I started getting t into the world of BDSM, even without having the words for it, I learned to really be expressive sexually and getting other people to express themselves in a playful way in a scene. Uh, that for me was just like mind blowing. And I was like, this is where created creativity really comes from is being like being able to be okay with who you are sexually so that you can interact with the world. Awesome, all such great answers. Um, so I'm gonna start with Lucy down there. Something that P.S. and Lucy, I kinda spoke about a little bit and kinda wanna get the rest of everyone else's answers as well, is something about family. Um, you know, in our backgrounds as Asian and American women, sort of what that has to do with the, the paths that we choose and, you know, combating that sometimes or, you know, adhering to them. I think it's always a fine line. So uh, my next question is, what does your family think about what you guys are doing? And also, what have you learned about yourself in this process of doing what you do? So my family situation is really interesting because, like, as, you know, I've been a pro-dom for eight years, and through that journey, I've done a lot of reflection of, like, where does this all come from? And a big part of, you know, kink and BDSM is not really just about sexuality. It's about, like, it's about, like, dominance and power play a lot of it and my I always say this my mom is the ultimate dominatrix you know <laughs> like she is you know dragon lady tiger mom all smashed together and when I think about like where you know when people they're like oh you're a very dominant person and they say it in a positive way because I see it as a positive way the biggest influence in that was actually my mother because she was a single mom, she got divorced, which you do not do in like a Vietnamese family, and she raised two kids, she ran her own business, and she was just hustling and like getting it together and showing that you didn't need a man, you didn't need somebody to like dictate how your life, and even though it breaks tradition, like you need to be who you are. And so that was like something like most of me being you know, a dominatrix is actually because of her. <laughs> and then the, you know, the, but the sexuality part, like that was the thing that was mostly difficult because Asian people don't speak about it. But my sister, she was the first person I told when I said, I think I'm gonna be, you know, I'm, I'm looking into, you know, kink and BDSM and being a dominatrix. And the first thing she said was, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> and so it just, so it was, I'm super lucky to have such a supportive family because that is not how it is, especially being in the sex industry and being a sex worker. Um, most people would be like, no, you know, but, but I've luckily have had a really, really good support network and my sister being the biggest support, the support I've had and my mother just being like the actual identity of what a dominatrix is. <laughs> Um, so, I've only been in this industry for one year, or a little bit over a year. Um, so actually, I haven't fully come out to my parents, letting them know that this is what I'm doing. Because not only am I quote-unquote modeling, I still feel weird telling that I'm a model to other people. Because, you know, most obviously, the, it started out as a WordPress, and then my Instagram became my WordPress. Uh, but Ultimately, it was just like, I'm not just wearing clothes. Sometimes I'm naked. And so, in that kind of taboo, because I'm Korean, and just like also being like, even portrayed sexually, even wearing lingerie is very like taboo. And being like plus size and sexual is like a double fetish in itself. So in the beginning, when I started modeling, it was like hard to be portrayed as a model like a lot of people like just wanted to put me in a box as like an escort or like a call girl or something and I'm just like that's not what I'm trying to do 
ultimately. But I feel like my parents low key know, because you know they have like that Asian instinct of like knowing what you're doing even though you don't tell them. And so my mom would sometimes be like, yeah, and it's like my mom would just be like, oh, you know, there's this one girl in Korea, and like she uh, she was in the workshop, and then like all these photographers told to told her to take her clothes off. Like you're not you're not doing anything like that, right? That, isn't that bizarre? Like, and I'm just like. Um, yeah, like I would never put myself in that kind of position. If anything, I would just be willingly to take my clothes off, you know, because <laughs> I'm, I'm getting paid for this or something, you know. Um, but I, I understand like her like concerns and stuff and then just like we've had like, you know, it's the whole entire like, I think it may be like an Asian persona. It's like you're doing something, people are going to talk shit about you. And then it's just like, well, Either way, it's inevitable. But at the same time, they're just like, be careful of what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be too much of a headache if you're in the public eye. And I was like, what do you know? <laughs> it's like, I didn't tell you anything. But ultimately, the only people that know is like my sister and one of my cousins. Um, they're like, oh my god, you're doing this and stuff. And then I'm just like, yeah, it's fun. Let's see how this goes. Because like, ultimately, this was not Every day is like a new day for me, you know? Um, well, I consider myself very lucky to have like very, a very supportive family. Um, my, I have two older brothers, and all of us were like immersed in the arts growing up, and my parents luckily are very, like, very supportive of me being an actor. Not the most exact, not exactly the most stable job here, especially in New York. Um, but I think there was, there's always this underlying pressure, especially from my parents, um, you know, being someone in the theater and, you know, them being so far away, they live on Guam. Um, so it's hard for them to, to, to realize that, like, theater here is not just big Broadway or, or, you know, starring in the films. I always get calls from my mom being like, okay, just, just audition and, like, book the thing and then, like, do the job. And I was like, okay, mom, it's not... It's not that easy to just star in Hamilton or, or being crazy rich Asians. Like it's a whole process and it's not, and it's really luck of the draw. Um, and on top of that, um, I feel personally that I'm, you know, along with being an actor, like moving into like the, the creative side of things and being like a fight choreographer and all of that and being on the quote unquote other side of the table, that's even harder for them to understand um, because they're like, you act, like you should be on the stage and on, on the screen, whereas they, whereas like being the person who teaches actors how to safely do a strike or like look like they can kill someone on stage but not actually kill them is, is something that's a little hard for them to understand. Um, but I, I still luckily get full support from them being like, okay, whatever you're doing, just do it. Um, and yeah, um, I think that's really all I have to say. I'm, I mean, I'm, that's sometimes like not the case. I have friends who have zero support from their families for being an actor. They're, like their parents tell them to, to self-fund. Um, and you know, it's, it's quite expensive being an actor here. Like along, you know, auditioning is not easy. You have to pay sometimes to pay to play almost. Um, you have to pay for headshots. You have to pay for lessons to keep your, to keep your tools and your voice and you know your body active and all of that. And and that that's a really hard price to pay, especially in an expensive city like this. Um, so again, like I consider myself very lucky to have that kind of support system. Um, I definitely don't have a great relationship with my parents. Um, we haven't talked for about two years. I made an active decision to stop talking to them after uh, I went to therapy for like the fourth, fifth. I don't know, six maybe, time, um, and, or the, like the sixth cycle of times. Um, I had a really big falling out with them after I, I was uh, at Columbia Business School going for my MBA and ended up leaving to pursue the food world. And that was a definitely a big divide in me, my family and I. But also after that I got married and my mother spoke at my wedding. We had a very, just like a chill dinner wedding. Um, and my mother said something along the lines of, well, we're so glad that Jenny is marrying Matt, my husband, because now she's, she's his problem. 
Um, and I was like, you know, I think that the sad thing is to realize that I can't change their minds. They're very stuck in their ways. They're not gonna like magically become woke tomorrow. I can't drag them to therapy. I can't even get them to get a dog even though they're empty nesting really hard and they have been for like, what, 10 years now? Um, I, like, and so if I was gonna have a relationship with them, I, I need to go to them versus them come to me and I am not emotionally at a place where I can do that, so I need to stop talking to them, period. Um, as I've started writing more about food and my experiences with food, a lot of that has become very vulnerable and personal. Um, I just wrote a piece about uh, the model minority myth that Asians deal with, and one of the stories around that was seeing that in action with my mother and how she was somewhat bullied at work and how she kind of translated that into a lot of anger and angst towards me at home. And so the, for the, the first communication I've had with them in a while was an angry message from her yesterday morning about A, sharing that with the world, B, saying that it was inaccurate because she doesn't, it's about saving face, I'm Chinese, so that's like a big thing. So it's like a very complicated ongoing relationship and one of the things that I realize is being able to even talk about it is again, the vulnerability is creativity thing, so being able to tap into that is important. Uh, I kind of going from family into being an individual here and what you do and also being an Asian woman in the fields that we're working in, how has that either positively or negatively impacted uh, what you're doing? How do you, how does that, I guess, color your experience and, and what you're doing in, in your world and just kind of delve into that? Yeah, let's start in the middle this time. P.S., you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, I definitely, I mean, I dabbled on it in, like, the beginning, like, when I started, like, taking pictures of myself and not intentionally wanting to be a model and, like, being fetishized as, like, a call girl or an escort. It just, like, put me in a state where I'm just, like, why is that the case? Because Asia in general is such a fatphobic culture. Um, like, I've been told, like, constantly since at, like, a young age, and that's basically how I use... Um, even like my past childhood life of how I was raised by my parents and disciplinary actions were not exactly disciplined in America per se and then so that mentally I don't know what the guidelines for profanity is but that kind of like fucked me up <laughs> for my adulthood and then so basically I put myself in these like abusive relationships to abusive relationships emotionally and physically through my partners and it was not until like 2016 of my longest like two year monogamous relationship that I realized that I put myself in these situations because I thought that was okay because of the way how I was raised. And I feel like a lot of girls gravitate towards that because like you don't know what's happening behind those doors. We're always told to excel in our school because we're a minority. We're always told that we had to be a doctor or a lawyer or something, get married to a man in our mid-20s and be well off that kind of way and just put your head down and do what you need to do. But I was never that girl. I like got my tattoo, my first one on my arm, which is like faded because I got it five times removed but my parents thought I was part of the lesbian mafia when I was 18. Um, and then so it just like all started off from like little rebellions by little rebellions that I did for myself because I was like raised in Florida in like a full on white private school up till like 14 and then went to like a rich public white school. So it's just like I was always a minority, always trying to fit in where I needed to go and then it's just like, who am I at the end of the day? It's also the reflection of being an Asian American and then trying to figure out of how much of your roots you're actually bringing into yourself right now. And I would talk to other Asian American friends and it's like, oh, now I am coming into terms that I'm actually Asian and I'm not like fully white. And then I really saw that like working in the photography world and then I would, I had an alias for my photography because I realized everyone had my real name. Like 500 girls had my real name, my first and last name because it was all around that time frame. Everyone was named Diana because all the Asian moms were obsessed with Princess Diana and that's how it was. <laughs> and, then, and then all of us come over from immigrant countries and we all had the same last name. So I like Googled my name one day and I was like, 
wow, there's like 500 of me. <laughs> How am I gonna make it in this world? So I made an alias and it was like DDC. And then so I did photography and I went to job to job and I started doing the e-commerce thing, the product coordination for like jewelry, ironically. Um, just because that's what I found on Craigslist. <laughs> and then, but then I realized like applying to jobs, I used my original name with my Asian last name and I didn't get any callbacks. But when I used my alias name, I got all the callbacks. Same fucking resume, just changing my name. And then I'm just like, why is that the case? It's like, oh, you have enough Asians for your quota for this month? Like, that's cool. Um, and also just like, Seeing me, it's just like, oh, she has tattoos, she has colored hair, she's gonna fuck us up. <laughs> it's just like, you know, that is not the case. And I think like um, I became more authoritative um, starting last year with like the people that I was working with. I was like, oh yeah, this is what I am, but I am giving you the work. Why am I ba getting paid less for it? You know. And then so ultimately, I would say like a good tip for even being a woman. In general, it's just like telling your bosses of what you're worth and like put your foot down. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I did it recklessly and impulsively. I just left. <laughs> I was like, bye, bitches. I'm getting a <laughs> spicy chicken combo from Wendy's and watching Logan alone. <laughs> and then I got a job the next day, double my price. So, quotes for the day. <laughs> Um, so I'm currently at a time of my life where I'm still trying to get over this thing called imposter syndrome um, as an Asian American woman in the, th in the theater. Um, so I, this is kind of really long winded, but I, I was born in the Philippines and then moved to Singapore and then Guam and then came here for school. And it wasn't until I came to America that I realized that I was a minority. Um, and it wasn't until like my like the end of my freshman year acting class where you know we'd have um, individual conferences with our acting teachers that my acting teacher Miss Shay um, this amazing black woman like called me into her office and she asked me this question she was like Isabel how does it feel to be like a minority in the class and I was like oh my god. I'm like one of two Asian girls in an all white class. And it didn't occur to me that, that it would be something that would affect my life going in to going into my industry, like from here on in, or even affected me even before I realized it. Um, and the same, and, and something similar happened to me coming out of school that another Asian American wom woman um, came into our class and lined up our, cl our class one by one individually and told us, this is what you need to work on. Um, this, you have like a bad attitude in this, but you're really good at this. Like lined us up, told us each individually like what we all needed to work on. She came to me and by that time, like I had this haircut. Like I had short hair. Um, I went into school with like really long mermaid hair. Like you know, your typical Filipina, you know, <laughs> long black mermaid hair. And I ended school with this kind of hair. She got to me and she was like, you're a really great dancer, you, you, know, you, take, you, uh, you take notes really well, let's talk about this haircut. And she was like, it's really cute on you, like in life, but you're gonna have to grow it out if you want anybody to take you seriously as an Asian American actor. And I was like, why? And she was like, you know, like casting directors, are, they, they're not gonna see Asian women without long hair because you, what, what do we have? Miss Saigon, we have King and I, we have um, Flower Drum Song, you know, all submissive women, all long hair. And it was just this like huge, like, like I feel like I exploded inside because I couldn't tell her like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and it kind of like sparked a rebellion in me. And you know, I still have this haircut and I to this day have probably played more little boys and men than I have played women on stage. Um, and I think that's my little act of rebellion. And also by simply being who I am um, as an actor and you know, the things that I've delved in into, you know, not just being like a ha ha musical theater, you know, girl who I can be. I'm fully capable of that and people know that. But also like 
I, I've delved into the physical acting. I've delved into the fight choreography. I've delved into ensemble training and to Shakespeare. And, you know, it's, it's, re it's really interesting because, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my plight. Like, I, I want to make that statement as, as an actor and an Asian American woman um, to be like, we are more than just submissive, long-haired girls who, you know, want to be saved by a white man, you know, and that's, that's you know, and that's an antiquated thought in the theater, and that's something that's, that's still constantly revived. Um, and in terms of what I'm doing right now as, like, a fight choreographer, I've... I've personally been very lucky to have mentors who, you know, who have taken me under their wing, it's especially in this job that I have right now as a fight choreographer for Henry VI at NACO. It was actually one of my um, professors who's actually my, my quote-unquote boss, who I'm assistant to. Um, he's a Filipino man um, and has done, like, all, like, an international artist, um, works with like really, really great people, Juilliard trained and all of that. And despite being taken under his wing, and you know, I have another mentor who's also an Asian man, like I, I still feel that imposter syndrome of being a woman, you know? And, and this process for me, which is all, almost coming to an end because our show is opening on Tuesday, um, is that throughout this whole process, I never knew like when, when I could step in to be like, okay, hey, to, to these actors who are actually much older than I am, like how can I, as like an Asian woman, like really just like stepping into the industry right now, like how can I tell you what to do? You know, how can I tell you how to move correctly and safely so that, you know, you don't hurt yourself or others? Where Where is my authority in that? Like I'm still trying to, personally like get over that um, and I think it's 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 not just me like there's so many other people who who find themselves as minorities women women of color you know queer people like we it's it's some it's like a hurdle that we all have to go through because there's this th there's this authority that has been telling us that we can't we're not capable of doing all of that and, you know, I'm still trying to find my power and stand in that. But, you know, this process of being a fight choreographer and telling people how to gouge other people's eyes out has really helped. <laughs> so it's interesting because, you know, the, there's two aspects of my job, right? So there's, you know, and I've talked about the Asian aspect and the woman aspect. So in my job, being a professional dominatrix, it's, I, you know, I monetize being Asian. You know, the Asian fetish is a big part of my job. You know, a lot of clients come and see me because I'm Asian, you know, and having a dominant Asian woman is part of, I can't tell you how many role plays where the role play is I am, you know, I belong to the dominant Asian race and the man is this white male and I'm Asian supremacy and the white male is my, you know, and how I've created this Asian colony and they are my slaves, you know? So that is a very common thing. And, and it's as like crazy as it sounds, there's, you know, there's the pros and cons in it, right? You know, the pro thing about a lot of, like most of my clients are white male privileged clients. You know, the pros being the fact that they're willing to, to see themselves in this other role, not only towards a woman, but towards an Asian woman. But the con being it's still fetishized. So you have to ask, and I ask myself too, because it becomes this ethical thing for me of like, okay, where do I draw the line of going, I want you to be able, as a white privileged man, be able to be vulnerable, which is why you're seeing me, which is great. Tap into your submissive t side, which is really great. Tap into your sexuality, especially a fluid part of your sexuality, where you're not 
identifying with being just a heterosexual, like, cis male, which is amazing. But then, then we have this racial part where you still want to fetishize me because I'm Asian and I'm playing a role that you're not used to seeing, which is a dominant Asian female. And so, you know, at the first, the beginning part of my career, you know, I worked at an all Asian dungeon. That was our thing, right? And it, you know, I never thought about the racial aspect too much because I was just starting my career. I was more interested in learning about kink and BDSM and all those dynamics and actually learning how to tie somebody up safely, learning how to do all these things that are very unsafe, right? And then as I've gone in my career, I've started and went independent and started my own company. I started to look at these racial aspects of sexuality and how they limit us, especially we see it in porn. We, you know, there, if you look at porn, there's not a white, you know, white girl like category. It's you see ebony and you see Asian. And those are your like, out of all sexual categories, those are your two racial categories that are huge. And so you start to ask yourself these things about like, what am I doing to like make this better or make it worse, right? So luckily now, being, I am in a really privileged position as, you know, not only as a sex worker, but I have got it, you know, as a privileged sex worker, you know, being able to have my own company, you know, having a place where I can, you know, change the mindset of a lot of really, you know, all my clients being CEOs and president, you know, like presidents of companies and things like that. Like I'm able to actually get them to look at their sexuality, their preferences, their racial preferences and change it, you know, and, and let them know and not play into it like, because they're having conversations with me that they're not having with anybody else in their life, you know? And to tell them, like, it's okay to have this fantasy, but let's deconstruct this fantasy and what the fuck that means. And also, you know, like, I've had to, when Trump got elected, I, like, had so many clients who voted for Trump, and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like you are seeing a sex worker right now, you're also seeing an Asian sex worker and an Asian sex worker who came from immigrant family. <laughs> like, you have to, and for them, nobody else is gonna have that conversation with them. But I'm able to because I'm their dominant, I'm their mistress, and I can say that, and I can say, this is what is wrong with how, how you're viewing all of this. And so, I'm lucky to be in that situa situation to do those things, but it has been, it's a love-hate relationship I have with the whole Asian fetish stereotype. It's the foot in the door that allows me to connect with people, but then while I'm there, my goal is to totally deconstruct why they have that, you know, that, you know, I love Asian women fetish. Like, what is that about? What does that mean to them? And so I try to do that in my job a lot by taking that position I have, that kind of being in that position to see these men, these most powerful men in the most vulnerable position they've ever been and saying, okay, here's the good things and here are the bad things, you know? And so, I mean, for my job, I think that's, you know, being a woman and being Asian has been like the best benefit but I also have to ask myself as being an Asian woman sex worker, am I perpetuating some of the bad sexual stereotypes that we have, you know? And what does that look like for me? Um, I could talk about a race and food for a long time. Uh, I think as a Asian female chef, uh, I, one of the things I, I and finally starting to come to terms with, talk more about, and talk more openly about, is really calling out all these implicit cultural hierarchies that I've mentioned, the way that we teach uh, food in schools. For instance, 
going to culinary school here in the city um, at ICE, I'll call them out by name, um, is like we spent tons of time in France, in Italy. Oh my gosh, there's so much terroir and all this stuff here. And then we literally, we've like forgot Indonesia existed. Uh, we forgot that most of India existed. We didn't even talk about that. Um, I was told that sweet and sour sauce needs ketchup in it or it's not authentic. I'm from Shanghai. We know how to make sweet and sour sauce. Thank you. You know, like, um, and just being told that my voice didn't matter, that my foods, my culture didn't matter, the foods of our culture is somehow less nuanced, less difficult, less complicated, and not important all the time. And no, it's no wonder that if you look around the restaurants in New York City, it's like at, you can put yuzu on a dish and now it's globally inspired, but you have no idea, like that chef doesn't know what to do about it. They don't know how to do it respectfully because they were never taught to. We're perpetuating a cycle of disrespect and nobody, feels they can do anything about it because if you look at the, the Michelin Guide, who's, who the hell is reviewing all our restaurants, it's all white dudes, a lot of French white dudes. Um, no offense to any of the nice white allies we have here, but like, like that's, that's part of the problem. Um, so I've been trying to talk about that more and write more about it, and I think media outlets are trying. They're trying their best, but at the same time, being an Asian woman, I will be asked all the time to be like, oh, you're Asian. Can you talk about this other Asian culture? Like, you're obviously an expert on Thai food as well, and sushi, and oh, also like maybe this curry, and I'm not. Um, and it's important to give voice to the right people, and I, I'm, not a, like, I'm not an expert on seasick. Like, you give that to a Filipino chef to talk about. So being able to help each other has been really hard because sometimes it feels like the jobs are scarce. So it's like, I want this selfishly for myself, but I feel like I'm taking out someone's voice as well. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely a complicated line. Um, as I've also grown as a chef, I feel like I've been able to like grow my audience and feel like I have a space to take a little bit more authoritative stance on the food I'm putting out there and what I'm calling it. For instance, at this last dinner, this Asian and American dinner that I did on Wednesday, um, I had a dessert that was called Saviors. There was a poem that went along with it and it was about white male saviors, some of them not even white, male saviors. And I called it the balls dessert because everything on the dessert was just, it looked like a pair of balls. Um, and it was just kind of talking about the fact that Asian women have been making s these dishes for a long time, have been training other people and they are not recognized. They like are consistently like, oh, well, Dan Barber said that he found cell two, so that's a lie. You know, Dan Barber has no fucking clue what he's talking about, but all of a sudden there's a chef's table Netflix about him. The pastry world is dominated with female chefs, and when we have chef's table pastry, there's one white female chef, and that's Christina Tosi. And they promoted her the hell out of her. Everyone else is a guy. So like, that's a real problem, um, and I don't see enough women saying enough about it um, in the food industry, and that makes me really angry as well. So I feel like, I've been doing my best to speak up. Thank you, guys. I feel like I could literally sit. I, I know we're running short of time. Um, I, I really actually have so many other questions for you, but I want to open up to our audience members any other questions, because you guys are really interesting, and I don't want anyone to miss out on being able to ask you questions directly. So who wants to go first? I'll just walk over to you. Anybody? Uh, yes? No? Yes? Anybody? No? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Is anything. I'm like doing squats. Anybody? No one. Oh, hey, here we go. Hey. Um, so what are, I guess, like one, I guess list one, like greatest challenge and greatest triumph that you've had in like your recent career or like overall career? Just like something that, the first thing that comes to mind when I say like triumph and challenge. Um, I find that, uh, I guess also being, I'm going to go touch base on the fact what, you know, being an Asian American and being fetishized has given me a leg up in the body positive modeling industry. However, at the same time, I am still considered a woman of color. Like, I'm still an Asian woman with 100% blood. <laughs> and then so I think, like, and that being a turn, I think I am 
I am flourishing in the industry much faster pace than a lot of other women I have encountered, which I am fully thankful of. But at the same time, I can use my push to represent all of my black fat femmes and also my Hispanic girlfriends as well who have been struggling with this industry, who are even signed in the industry and still be neglected, a neglected of like who they are in general. Like I have one friend who is like full on Hispanic and then they're like, oh well, you pass as a black girl, it's fine. And they're going to use her portrayed as a black girl for their campaign. And they're supposed to be a body positive campaign. So at that time, you would think like, oh wow, the industry is changing, but not there yet at the same time. So I would say my biggest triumph is being able to put my foot in the door, but the struggles of it is still concurs. Like even being just five foot five, I'm way below like the industry standard of a plus size model. I went to only one model casting, and they're like, who is this girl? She is awesome, and she has like a lot of followers, blah, 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 blah. We can use her to get more money. Um, but then they're like, how tall is she? And she's like, 5'5". Five, five. Oh, honey, you're too small. You have to be 5'10 to be even on print. And it's just like, oh. So being like a plus size girl, you have to be 5'10 to be on print. But as a straight size model, you can be 5'6 or 5'7. Why does that even matter if you're going to be on print? So ultimately, I think I am breaking the industry. I am not signed with anyone. I manage everything on myself. And I think it was like an interview. They were like saying this terminology of being an entrepreneur. But why does that even need to be a terminology for being a femme and an entrepreneur? I'm a sole entrepreneur myself. It's like, um, I say what I want to. <laughs> exactly. Get that money. And then <laughs> it's like, don't tell anyone that you know, I think that's the whole thing is just like me realizing what my worth is, asking for what I want, and just being affirm with it. And that's like a huge part of it. And I feel like all of us in general, we're in a very fetishized and also machismo kind of industry, and we really need to put our word out there and not just be like abiding and put our heads down like an Asian woman would do back in the 19th century. So, you know, that's basically it. <laughs> Um, I'll make this quick. I had a funny experience, so I'll start with Triumph. Um, this year I've been focusing more on doing more speaking engagements, and I um, was asked to do a keynote speech, my first keynote in Minneapolis, of all places, um, which will be interesting. Um, it's 30 minutes, and it's about vulnerability. Well, I, I will make it about vulnerability and creativity. It's for an art and tech conference, and obviously we can imagine the composition of Minneapolis, so uh, I'm pretty excited to go out there and show them that Asians can do lots of things. Um, ironically, as I uh, you know, got that and was planning my logistics around it, um, I was asked to speak at another conference where the guy would not pay for my expenses. And I, when I told him to, I, he, I, he needed to pay for my expenses, I was willing to do it for free. It was a relatively big summit. Um, he told me that he would pay for 75% of my expenses if I also wrote two articles for free and it was super satisfying to email back and say, I actually am paid to write as well, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all. Yes. <laughs> well, I feel like one of my greatest triumphs, it, triumphs is um, getting into the rooms that I've been asked to be a part of. Um, simply, by, and, and by getting recognized that I am capable as an Asian woman to lead a group, um, but the challenge is living up to that expectation. Uh, yeah, and also getting, um, getting paid what I'm worth is a huge challenge, especially for me, and speaking up about that. Yeah. Lucy? Um, for me, I think one of the biggest triumphs was actually truly coming out, and, and coming out in the sense of being a sex worker, because you know, for about like four to five years while I was, you know, full-time dominatrix, I, you know, I used to work in fashion. I had a really great job and it was always like when people would ask me what I do, I would be like, oh, you know, I'm in, you know, I'm a 
professional dominatrix, but I also do fashion. I was always doing that but to justify what I do, to make myself feel better because I felt what I did was not enough and, and to final, finally be like, no, I'm a, you know, I'm a professional dominatrix. I'm a fucking sex worker. I own my own business. I run my own company. I do a weekly, you know, it's like what I do is enough and that is great. You know, and so to finally just be like, I'm not gonna, there's no if and buts about it, and this is who I am. That was like a really big moment for me personally. And I would say the biggest challenge more than anything is I think, it, you know, for me it's not being a woman and it's not being an Asian woman. You know, it's actually being a sex worker and what that means in our society right now where we have these different you know waves of feminism and you know we have women who are still pitting each other you know against each other because we still slut shame and we still kind of and that's the biggest the hurdle that we face as women more than anything is to support each other and it's really the patriarchy that has pitted us against each other to slut shame and to say like what you do is not good enough or how you dress is this or that or being a sex worker is not a valid choice or job like and so that has been the biggest challenge and I've also been lucky to be a fa you know be someone that people do want to interview or connect with or write about because they're like because I have a quote unquote better image as a sex worker compared to someone who may be fully tatted up and didn't go to college and all of that stuff. I mean, as much as it's shitty that I have, that you have to be this type of person to, um, to have that image, I'd rather use the fact that I have that privilege to get the right voices and get the right people to understand that, you know, sex workers are very diverse and you know, and it's okay. And for other women to not feel intimidated by supporting sex workers because to support women's rights is to f support all our rights. That's awesome. Anybody? Anyone? Yeah. Yes, I'm with you. I'm with you back there. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, before, if anyone, if people don't have questions, uh, before we enter, I'd love to ask where we can find you guys on social media websites, how can we connect with you so everybody in this room and beyond can find you? Um, I'm under Lucy Sweetkill, so all my stuff is under Lucy Sweetkill. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, I have a website, um, and then my company is called La Maison de Rouge, and we actually host a live weekly broadcast every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we interview other sex workers and those who participate in alternative sexuality. Um, we do demos, and we cover everything between you know, sex work, BDSM, kink, spirituality, and the intersection of all of it. Um, as of right now, I am just found on Instagram, so p.s. like postscript, and then Kaguya, K-A-G-U-Y-A. -A. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Y-Z-J-A-S-A -A is Jasa, um, and I have a website, isbeljasa.com. Uh, I'm on, I think all, every, yeah, all my social channels are on Chef Jenny Dorsey, Jenny with a Y, and... Dorsey with the D as opposed to, I don't know what else it would be. <laughs> awesome. Um, very cool. Well, I, I don't know. Is this time then? Can we give a huge round of applause for everybody? Oh my God. Yes. Ladies, you're all really inspirational. Thank you very, very much.